Yeah, so did you... Were you given more of what can I do, or were you given more of what do you do? This tells me who the people pleasers are and who are the... What uh, can I do? The yeah. perfection, huh? What can I do? So, see, Jeremy said that is the right question to ask, right? What can I do? Um, and maybe you ask that and you got some what you do do uh, answers to that. <laughs> but um, if you were discussing it, then that's awesome. And, and uh, let that be a springboard. Um, you can let that be a rolling assignment. We'll have another assignment that's kind of based off of the class tonight. Um, and if you weren't here last week, you can always catch up. You can do last week's homework assignment this week. It was uh, ask your spouse uh, three things that uh, you can do to make them happy, and then uh, ask, uh, and then get to reciprocate and do, have your turn as well in that. Uh, and again, it was meant to be a bonding experience, not a uh, a fight causing experience and I hope you hope can do that. The, last week's class was, uh, and, and they're all, we're all coming from the same standpoint, um, and uh, how can I build up my marriage? Uh, last week we started to be happy. And it's what everybody wants in, in marriage, but it seems to be so elusive. And, and uh, see, Kelly wanted me to finish this up. I don't see Kelly now. So She's I'm, at the funeral home in Glasgow. Okay, oh, okay. Well, I, um, how many of you brought your sheets back from last week? Okay, all right. Well, I'll take a little bit of time just to just to fill in that last blank few blank fillers there. Um, we were talking about the fact that happiness is a choice. Happiness is a selfless choice, and that happiness is a choice to be content. And we talked about uh, how you can what uh, what choices you, or how you can go about making the choices to be content. And, and I only mentioned three things. And we were kind of short on time. So I want to make sure that I don't short you on, on that. Um, how can you choose to be content? You remember what we said last time? We gave two answers. I, I may have been going too fast for you to get them. Believe that you can. Believe that you can. Um, we talked about Paul as an example, and we said, he said, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances that I'm, uh, that I'm in. And we said that wasn't some ivory tower academic uh, statement for Paul, because where did he write that from? From a prison, from a jail cell, right? And so uh, he says in the very next verse, I know how to be abased. I know how to be uh, how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I've learned to be full and hungry, both to abound and suffer need. I can do what? All things. all things through Christ who strengthens me. Believe that you can. If Paul believed he could be content in prison, we can be content in our marriages when there are some downs as well as some ups. So that's the first point. Number two, what, did you get that one? Wrong one. Look at, uh, yeah, exactly. Look at Roger and Joyce, right? Um, no, I did. Pick content role models. No, I don't want to, no pressure on there at all. But I did mention, I don't know when I was going to put this uh, out there, but I don't know how long it was, Kathy. It was 20 years ago, I think, when we were in Fort Worth um, out there and stayed with a couple, Bill and Joanne Charbine, and um, stayed in their home for, the, uh, for about three or four days from speaking out there. And um, the story that stands out in my mind, about, I, I talk so much, I don't know when I've said something. I told the story about the camera at the restaurant in Dallas. I probably told somebody in here, but I don't you remember. So we went out to lunch with them, and you know where JFK was shot, uh, basically speaking the library and all that, there's a nice restaurant there, and, and it's kind of a little, um, the top floor is turning uh, at all times. It's a pretty cool place. We went up there to eat lunch, no, we just went up there to see. We went somewhere cheaper for lunch and we went up there and just looked, looked around. Anyway, um, the girls had to go went to the restroom before we went back to Fort Worth. And we were out there and we were driving in the car and we were almost back. This busy restaurant, people in and out there all the time. When uh, Joanne says to Bill, I left my camera, my brand new camera. You just got, I mean, it's one of those DSLR real nice, you know, um, in the bathroom. Well, you know, it's, first of all, it's a drive to go all the way back there. There's a schedule to keep, and there's the fact that it probably didn't last five minutes. You know, I'm sure he called down there. I don't know what, I don't know how that turned out. Here's, here's the point. She goes, she's just apologizing, and he said, you know, I've been wanting a camera for my birthday. You know, and then, so basically what, what happened was he was going to get her replace that, that camera. And, and, and these, 
for, not from appearance to say these weren't very, very wealthy people. It was a still been a sacrificial thing for this to happen. But it impressed us to the point, and we watched them interact. That was just, that's the symbol of what we saw in the morning and the evening, how they treated one another, the love and respect. And it got to be where um, we used them as a verb. Remember I said that last week that there's a couple we used as a verb? And when Kathy does something out of the blue, just, I mean, just wonderful loving, and, 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 I, and I, I say, and this, she came up with it, not, but I used it too. She said, I feel so sharp by it. Or, and, and the thing, that's the compliment we paid to that couple is because they were not without problems. They eventually had a, a grand, well, about that time, I guess, that grandson committed suicide. Uh, they knew tragedy. They had tragedy with one of their, their children. And, and so, and they had health problems. He had various, very uh, serious health problems. So they had all the ups and downs that we talked about, those problem areas. But they learned through that to demonstrate qualities that we wanted to emulate. You're going to find those folks all the time. Remember what I said last week is there are plenty of couples that we might lean on as examples that may not be very functional examples. Even if they're close to us in our lives, they may be doing things. And if we look to them to try to, to find happiness through their example, we're not going to find them. Now, as we work on that, we can become that for others. But my point is... You've got to find the right role models, okay, to, for contentment. And we said more about that, but I don't want to teach that class again. Let me just get to this. Oh, I did end. I was, I was rapid firing at the end. I hope you wrote down Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18, that last passage that we talked about, where Habakkuk is trying to reconcile the suffering that the people of God are doing at the hands of the Chaldeans. And um, finally, that third chapter is his song of victory and acceptance where he says, and he ends that, the, in fact, that's the end of the book where he says, though all these bad things are happening, the vine, the fig, the land, all that, the, the, the stalls, the herd, I said, even though all that's not going my way, he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And we gave the 21st century equivalents of that. Though all these things are happening in my life that are not happiness makers, though those things are occurring, we can say, we can choose to say, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will give joy to God of my salvation. It's, it's a, it's, you have the power to respond in that way. All right, and then the last thing before we move on is take real dramatic steps. It's easy to talk about that, but we, can, we need to take the steps to choose to be content. The homosexual community has used an argument to defend the lifestyle, and you've maybe heard this one before. And that is, um, I can't choose this. This is the way that I am. I was born that way, okay? And, and I think from a biological standpoint, even from a psychological standpoint, we would recognize that as a crutch. I say that to say this, is that while we may recognize that that's not a legitimate argument, so often, outside of sexual orientation, we do the same thing with regard to who we are in marriage or in life. You explode at your, your, your spouse or your kids, and what do you say in defense? I'm just passionate. Or, you know me, I have a temper problem. It's just, it's just who I am. Or, you withdraw, and you refuse to discuss your problems, and what is the response to that? I'm just a piece of I, I'm, I'm passive. You know that about me. I'm an introvert, and, and I'm, just, I'm just not geared that way. Or you're a perfectionist, and you demand or expect those around you to be perfect. You can't be pleased. And if called on it, you just say, or you're engrossed with pornography, or dishonesty, or impulsive spending, or fill in the blank. You see, we might rightly condemn those who are trying to hide behind biology or temperament or makeup or background as a crutch to be who they are, but we can fall into that and let that infect our way of thinking. You see, you've got to take the steps to get to where you want to be. So let's bring this back to being content with your spouse and finding contentment in your marriage. Jesus and the disciples are on their way back to Jerusalem, and they go through a Samaritan village. And the, the Samaritans do not want to receive Jesus. And do you remember what happens next? It involves John. 
What were James and John's uh, nickname? Anybody know? The sons of thunder. You remember what he says on that occasion? Lord, do what? Bring down fire. Bring down fire from heaven. Destroy them. It's just how John is, right? No. If you want to think about, you know that, that the sons of thunder is his nickname, but if you think about who John is and you want to give him a nickname, what nickname do you use more than that? The apostle of what? Of love. It was the apostle of Christ. But think about it. Who gives it? I know Paul gives us the definition of love in 1 Corinthians 13, but just go to 1 John 2 and look at that chapter and see count how many times he uses the word love. You look even in, in the Gospel of John, and you see that as a theme. So here's the question. Did he stay a son of thunder, or did he channel that? Did he change? Do we have to stay where we are? You see, he, uh, here, here's the one that really, to me, makes it even more powerful. And see, he didn't change his personality. And maybe a better example of that is, is Peter. Think about Peter in the ministry of Christ. I mean, don't do don't, that free association. Don't even think about it. Peter was what? In the ministry of Christ. Impetuous. Impetuous. I mean, he was, he'll pop off at the mouth. He's going to talk seemingly without speaking. He's the one that said, you're the Son of God. And the Lord in just a few more verses later says, get behind me, Satan. You know, he just, he just never knew. He was ready to jump out of the boat. Lord, it's good for us to be here. You know, example after example. He denies the Lord with that man. But what does the Lord ask him to do? Yeah, feed my sheep. And think about how he goes about to do that. He preaches the first, and this, and this is powerful. He preaches the first sermon. Who's he preaching to in Acts 2? In Acts 2. The Jews. So the Lord says, the first time that my gospel goes to the Jews, who do I, whose mouth do I want open talking to folks? Peter. Acts chapter 10. Who does Peter preach the first sermon to? The Gentiles. So that's basically everybody. The Lord says, okay, Peter, it's just who you are. Can't use you. Sorry. Got to find, hey, uh, Simon the Zealot, maybe you can do it. No, he says... I can, I can take, I can change. You're not stuck there. You take some of those qualities that need to be channeled, but it can bring you to a better place. So, my point in all that is, is we don't have to stay captive or bound to what we have been, to who we used to be. Nor should we lean on that as an excuse for what we ought to be. So, I'll close this out so we can get to the nice lesson. Um, you, you maybe heard about the, the kid in junior high who just seemed to be have everything going his way. And so his buddy came up to him and he said, Man, I, I bet you're a happy guy, aren't you? And he says, No way. How could I be happy? If I had a girlfriend, then I'd be happy. Well, he saw him in high school, ran into him, and he goes, Well, she's pretty. You're, you're happy, aren't you now? Surely. And he goes, Well, what good is a, is a girlfriend if you don't have a car? If I had a car. <clears throat> then I'd be happy. And then it's if, if I went to college, I'd be happy. And then if I had kids, I'd be happy. If I had a career, I'd be happy. And if I could get rid of the kids and, and I could retire. And so he, you can imagine how life was him all the way through. He got to the end of life, and guess what he was still looking for? Happiness. Why? Because I'll be happy when. I won't be happy until. You know, a guy like that can live a thousand lifetimes and live a million years and have everything that a person says they need to be happy and they'll never get there because they're looking for something or someone to give them what they themselves have complete control over. And that is to learn where happiness is found. Happiness is found certainly first and foremost from God, but it's got to be it's got to come from within. It's, it's not based on the circumstances you're in. Paul teaches us that. It's based on who we are in those circumstances. Okay? Any questions or comments on that? I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm not uh, intending at all to preach. And, and uh, uh, this is something, you, if you guys, if any of you guys were made dragged into the classroom, you know, you, you, uh, I'm sure you're not, or even your wives. Um, it's, it's tough being the guy up here and talking because anytime it's the subject of marriage or child rearing, it's a vulnerable position because nobody does either of those things perfectly. And we're all works in, project, in process, work projects that are ongoing. So you'll, you'll keep that in mind, I'll keep that in mind. All right. 
Shifting gears here. Number two, how can I build up my marriage? Be hardworking. So let me start here right now. Somebody in all humility, if you don't mind, we'll give you that caveat up front. Tell us something that you think that you might do, at least reasonably well. What is something that you can, maybe it's a hobby, it's an interest, it's a skill. Oh, the art. Um, see, here's the point. This is something nobody can judge me if I say it, because, you know, we all got to do that. All right, so mowing the yard. All right, do you feel like you're pretty good at doing that? All right, so tell me, first of all, how is it that you arrived at that conclusion? That you do a good job? I ran a mowing business for about eight years. All right, years, so. okay. So how many yards did you mow? At one time, I had 26. 26 yards. Okay. So um, you're doing that. I guess it's, it's not even seasonal. That can be year round. Yeah. You're doing okay. Year this okay. So, how did you get to be good at? It? Honestly, learning from others. Ah. Okay. So, how did you? Did, were there any? Is there a technique involved in that? I know there's others in here that can answer and talk about that. But what what technique? Or is there a technique to that? I mean, there's a little bit of art to it, I guess. Okay. What's the art? Straight lines. Okay, straight lines. All right. Uh, so aesthetics are involved. Yeah. All right. What else? Anything else about that? Finesse. Okay. If you're doing 28 yards, there's got to be something else involved. Efficient. Yeah, that's a probably a better way word than I was going to use. Efficient, all right. Practice. All right, good, great example. And some hey, get the gold star for going first because nobody ever wants to go first. What else? Give me another example. A lady. Let me hear from a lady. So, cook. All right. Hey, and I'm giving you permission to brag, so it's it's not you're not crossing any lines here. All right, so. Tell me what's involved in being a good cook. First of all, how did you get, how did you get develop your interest in cooking? Well, I got a hungry husband. All right. All right. You were mean to me. All right. All right. So, what's involved in your having become a good cook? It's a trial and error. Okay, good. Certainly is. All right. So, I put you on the spot, but how many times a, a week? Say you practice. Okay. Up to 21 for most people, maybe 30, 35, depending on who you are, right? Okay, all right. So, what's your specialty? What do you like? I hear I make a pretty good Alfredo. All right. So, how did you learn that? Is that a family recipe or did you look on Pinterest or? All right, so that's that's a degree of, of expertise right there when you're, you know, you can't write a recipe down and say, just come into the kitchen, I'll show you how to do yeah. it. All right. All right. So, and, and just what are some other hobbies and interests real quick that you guys, how many of you guys play sports? All right, so you think about what's involved in getting good at that. Now, obviously, talent, some things are raw talent, right? But you think about some of the best players you ever knew, uh, we had a guy who was offensive guard, and we were at 4A in Georgia, and that was the biggest schools that we had. He was 165 pounds, <clears throat> and he was a starter. Now, of course, it's a different day. That was 1988 when I graduated. You couldn't do that today. But uh, we, in the playoffs, we played Valdosta, and their, uh, their average defensive line in 1988 was 270, 280 pounds, so a lot more than the average because they were a, a, a meat rack school. You know, They just had guys come in. But you think about guys that you do like that, maybe a, a, a high-performing uh, guard on, on a basketball team who maybe wasn't blessed with a lot of uh, height or, or jumping ability, but just uh, was a hard worker. Anything, and, and, and you take the other side of that, uh, I understand there's pickup basketball to be played here. I still haven't gotten in on that action yet. Um, but what happens when you've not done that in a while? Or when you get out of practice? If it were to be cooking, if it were to be cutting the yard, or if it is to play sports, 
And then sometimes the, the, the body can't cash the checks, the mind writes, right? So in all of this, we understand the concept of whatever it is. A lot of you, the, the good things that you're able to do, whether it's hobbies, interests, you, you may read up on it. You may look at, at role models. You may, um, uh, through practice or trial and error, you may just knock it around DIY style, whatever it is. You, you work at it to get where you're going to be. But somehow we think that it's going to be different when it comes to marriage. If, if we are going to be successful, if we're going to build up our marriages and get them to a, a better place, and I love, uh, let's use Michael's analogy, let's beat uh, yesterday. Let's beat with beat. Yeah, that's what I thought I said. I, I was thinking about the class a little bit. I was listening. Um, I got the concept. So if we're going to do that, we've got to work hard. Right? Um, the opposite of that is lazy, careless, indifferent. Uh, not putting in the, the work at all. And you, you can't expect to move up or to improve if you're not doing anything to contribute to that end. So, we want to be hard working. Um, Dennis Rainey wrote the book, Staying Close. And he made a comment, and, and I have recommended this quite a bit. This is a resource Kathy found originally. It's written by Dennis and Barbara Rainey. If you're looking for a book on your bookshelf uh, in, on the subject of marriage, they're not members of, of the church, but they are, are uh, excellent uh, writers and very professional. Uh, and it's, a, it's an excellent, good read. It's called Staying Close. And he makes a statement in that that I found stark. He said, 95% of all marriages suffer from isolation. And few realize how desperately alone they really are. He says, often a husband and wife begin drifting apart so slowly that they hardly recognize that it's happening. And then after a few years of hiding and poor communication, they realize that their once romantic life has grown stale. That's why many successful looking marriages aren't much more than two successful people independently doing their own thing. They aren't friends and they aren't life partners. 95%. That's a staggering number. I don't know how you quantify that. I, I'm not his fact checker. But if it's anywhere near that, that's way too high. So how do how do we how do we offset that? We need to understand. Yes, ma'am. You know what you were talking about that made me think about um, right now in our lives and a lot of people's lives are seeing their parents get older. Uh -huh. And what's what has been hard on, on me and even Derek is uh, to watch that isolation, um, especially in not only parents here, and that your fear currently is that that would happen in your own marriage. And we talk about the time of like, I don't want to become a, my mom and dad or your mom and dad. Because we watch that isolation and that separation and where they're not communicating and they're just coexisting there. Like, so, um, well, we talk about, and we, and we certainly appreciate the fact that um, statistics you've heard in marriage classes, I, I'm sure, about um, the, the average divorce. Do you remember what the, how, the average duration of a marriage in our culture? And that number changes, but it doesn't really a lot. The number at one time, last statistic I looked at was 7.1 years. The average. Now, there's, you think about what you factor into that, right? There are people who've been married seven, eight times. You can't you have to amortize that over you know, 20 years. That's four years of marriage. That's going to drag down the numbers a little bit. Um, and we don't want really to just be survivors. We don't just want to say, I made it to 50, I made it to 55, which is a great achievement against the flow of a culture that doesn't value long-term commitment. But we don't want to settle for just that. If that means in that length of time that, that we're not staying close. And it's, it's the premise of the book is that our natural tendency is to drift apart. It's not to stay close. I think when we're young, we idealize when we get married that, that the natural default state will be to be close. And something bad will have to happen to pull us apart. But no. And we're going to talk about that. There are so many things pulling at our lives that are pulling us apart that we've got to work at staying close. Um, and, I, and I think it makes a point. Um, I've heard it said sometimes that growing old together is more like growing old than growing together. So you, can, you can flip that and it makes it more, more, more successful. Mm -hmm. You tend to thrive instead of survive. That's right. That's right. I mean, if you think about the fact that that really outside of our salvation, the greatest gift that God has given to us is, is our marriage. Um, you have, you know, 
your your children come and go, right? And your one, even if they live in your community, they come they come into your house, they leave out of your house. Um, your parents pre precede you, but they're probably going to leave this earth before you. Church friends come and go. I mean, you think of friends in your life, there's that one constant there, and that is intended to be a blessing. God wants us to have that companionship and that closeness that can get us through all those those different phases and periods of life. Um, but we know what God, when, when God made this statement, it is not good for man to be alone. In what context did he say Like I said, what's kind of rhetorical? Genesis 2, verse 18. God says that with regard to bringing Eve to the, to the man. It's easy for us to take marriage for granted, to adopt the mentality that since there's no crises going on, everything's okay. We may even feel positive toward each other and assume that we're doing okay. But the status quo may ignore that there are some things going on that need work. Unresolved differences. Prioritizing the needs of others over the needs of our spouse. Or failing to talk about outside interests and relationships. So, I'm going to break this down into three categories. Number one, what keeps us from working hard on our marriages? Generally speaking, not talking about your marriage, or, or you can talk about your neighbor's marriage, but just generally speaking. We can, we can make it more abstract and it's not, you know, it's so uncomfortable maybe. But what keeps people from working on their marriages? Right. Okay, children? Somebody said something else? Pride. Pride. Okay, interesting. Work. All right. This is a good list. Good start. Anything else? Um, time. Time? Okay. I'll just say a lack of energy. Uh, in, in with all that, you work all day, you've got kids to take care of. Sometimes you give your spouse the leftovers at night when okay. everything's finally done. Good. <clears throat> I guess you could say complacency. Okay. seen a lot of marriages happen in our times we, we've seen a lot and you see these things that, that come come up anything else I think it's a good start let me let me just kind of chew through some of these uh, you've you've hit a lot of what I want to say so I won't spend a lot of time on it but just to kind of drill down maybe a little bit number, number one crowded calendars so what crowds our calendars some of the things you mentioned here uh, kids activities uh, that can that can become a very hectic frenetic pace of life. And depending on how much your kids are involved in, you feel like you're going from one uh, to the other. Uh, our kids didn't play on into high school, but then when they played football, we had three boys two years apart. You can do the math. It was played city league. Uh, you know what? Two years is just enough time to they, that they were all on a different team. Two parents, three kids, fields all over the city of, uh, of Richmond. We were all over the place. And, and it felt like, and there's practice. You know, I, and that's changed even in time. I remember when I was a kid, I remember being that it's all consuming as it seemed like they're you know, doing all these practices and it can get it can get much more involved than that, right? Not not saying those things are wrong. We, we, we did that. And, and balance is the key in anything in life, right? But it can get to the point where it can be a hindrance. It can take suck some of the energy out when everything seems to be revolving around uh, our, our kids and trying to navigate all of that can be tough when it comes to our working on our marriage. Uh, being involved in, and I, I, I call this civic involvement, so responsibilities to organizations that we might be a part of to help our community be better. Is that a good thing? Don't we need to be light and solved out in the community? Sure. Does it, God, God needs us there. So I'm not speaking against any of these things, but they can, they can really fill that calendar up if we don't make some choices and, and make some priorities. Meetings for work, social obligations, the frantic, just a general, frantic racing from one thing to the next. Time with extended family. Outside hobbies and interests. And so it, it's something that we've got to keep in balance. Number two, 
I'm not sure we exactly said this, but stubborn secrets, whether bad habits that we're hiding, unwholesome relationships, if it's past sins that we're, that we're keeping, if it's present struggles, if it's future fears, secrets build walls between couples that keep each other out. You know, typically the ironic thing is keeping the secret takes more energy than it would to be working on that instead. Number three, spellbinding screens. This, is, this has evolved very quickly. I can't, it was not that many years ago. I was given an assignment somewhere, and it was uh, teens and social media. And basically, at that time, I mean, this wasn't decades ago, this was just a few years ago, and it seemed pretty cutting edge at the time. That's how fast this has evolved. And it was basically parents were concerned because they're, they, giving their kids smartphones was kind of a newer thing at that time. Um, at least not all parents were doing that. And it was a concern that parents had that their kids were always at the table and out in public and when they were doing social stuff and they had their faces and phones. I wouldn't be giving that assignment today, I'm pretty sure. Uh, and the, the reason is simple, right? Now, we've, we've been kind of distanced because of, of the COVID stuff, but going into a restaurant, isn't that an interesting study in psychology? Any of you ever fly? Same, I mean, any kind of public space. Just conduct an experiment. Just sit back and see. Now, those things can be such a, a time saver. They can be, they can help us do so. And, and they're so handy. They're so convenient. And I know, I, I can say I talk a lot, so I've probably told this story before. I would say stop it, but I don't want to big thunderous roar. But if, if I did, just I'll see your face. I'll know that I've told you. I was in, I was in Papa Do's in the airport a few years ago. And I, I went down and I sat down by myself. I was, had a long connection. And this couple came down together. They were, the way they were dressed, one of their, their luggage, you could tell for sure they were on vacation. It looked like a romantic getaway. They looked like they were of child uh, uh, rearing years. And so a lot of people, they were uh, able to get away. And, and they came in there for a big long escalator. They came out in there. They had a seat. And um, she was just talking, exciting, you know. He wasn't a big talker anyway, but he was there, he was there. And as soon as they sat down, it was like Pavlov's dog. He pulled out the phone. And the way I was sitting, I could see him on his side, and he was trolling on Facebook. I mean, he would like stick it all the way from his face, but that's what he was looking at. And she's talking to him, and she's all excited, and I don't know what they're saying, but there's this happening, and, and he's just, he's as determined as she is, right? Every once in a while, a little monosyllabic, grunt, you know. He barely looked up to, to order his food, went back right back down to it. And for the and, and so she tries for several more minutes. Finally guess what she does? Rolls out her phone. Out. Rolls out her phone. If you can't be them, join. Now, we talked about you know fiftieth anniversary and all that. Can you imagine if everything was captured as it happens? There they are in, in 2040-something at their 50th anniversary. And folks are looking at all the, you know, the, the collage of photos that come popping up there. And there's his 30th birthday. There's, you know, their, their 15th anniversary. There's that vacation trip they took to, now we may pull up our phone long enough to take a selfie or whatever, but if it was caught as it happened, would they want to look back and say, our marriage was one long look and scream. But but life is lived out moments at a time. And there's and I don't I don't know who we might pick who can get up here and can speak with complete moral authority as, as a non offender. And I, and I don't want you to sit here listening as one who's judging your mate for their shortcomings in this regard. I think it's because of its convenience and because of its omnipresence, it's difficult for it not to become a hindrance or an impediment that stands between us and our spouse. Um, so that can be something that can stand in the way of that. I, I don't want to be, I don't want to be too hard, but it's really not new, is it? It's, it's smaller, it's more compact, but can it take another version? Uh, I would say the 52 inch variety, but when we were growing up, man, the thought of a 25 inch television was, in, I didn't have color TV, 
but you know, but that was it was, and, and I was the remote controller, you know. Um, but it can become an impediment. Distractions like that, spellbinding screens, are what we're talking about. Number next, uh, a polarity in parenting philosophy. What if the parents are on the same page about how to to discipline the, the children? Does that become something that keeps you from working hard on the marriage? And you know what can happen is yin can spawn yang, and yang can react to yin, and, and it can one's tendency can make the other's tendency worse. So you might have one that is over-involved, and what can the other person do in response to that? I'm going to step back because there's a helicopter parent, and I'm going to just, you know, and you can get to the point where you overcompensate there. Or one is strict, so what does the other one do in response? I'm going to slack up. Um, or hands-on versus hands-off. And here's the thing we, we need to understand about our, our children. Now, and we're, learn, we're still learning things about what happened in our kids' childhood that we didn't know growing up and that's of course that's a, a long honored tradition uh, I told my parents a lot of things after I grew up they didn't have any idea what's going on but um, I, I know that it's always true our kids are so smart they are a lot smarter than we give them credit for and if they can see a crack of daylight between mom and dad's philosophy you know what they're going to do they're going to drive a wedge right in between they're not, not because they're evil because they're they're smart. Wouldn't you do that if you could gain an advantage? And if you could play one against the other, against your better nature, wouldn't you try to do that? And so, how do you how do you deal with that? How do you deal with a a, a diverse philosophy on how to handle something with your children? Communication. Okay, that's the right answer, Rick. Communication, but. Here's the thing. You have little Johnny. We have any, any of y'all kids named Johnny? I looked out real quick. Okay, little Johnny's there. And little Johnny sees um, mom and dad fighting. Or there's a, something that has to be decided with Johnny. And mom says whatever she says. And dad says the opposite. And they begin communicating about that. I think he should. Have been, I don't think he should. Have been, that, 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 that. Here's Johnny. Well, you got to set time aside. Okay. Little Johnny ain't around. And, 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 I, and I use your comment as, as, as a, a springboard because if we're not careful, that's when we try to handle that. Don't handle that around Little Johnny. You handle that when you're away from Little Johnny. Because what's Little Johnny, what he needs to see is mom and dad are on the same page. It took me years, but I finally figured that out. Well, and, 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 and the thing is, is, think about what it does. It can do what kind of impact it can have on the marriage relationship. Um, because it's inevitable. You're two people with two minds. You're going to have two different points of view uh, on more than one occasion. And so you handle that so that they see a united front. I tried that two or three times with mom and dad, and uh, it was always easier to get what you wanted with mom. But dad quickly found that uh, you don't ask for one. And if you ask more than one, it's a trip to the barn. <laughs> and the trip to the barn was very painful. And what y'all do at the barn? <laughs> <laughs> he he, had, he uh, demonstrated I, I proper that, and uh, improper use of leather. We had a different euphemism for it, but yeah, I understand. Exactly. All right, and, and that, you get the point there. We, we need to be on the same page, certainly in front of our kids, for sure. Um, uh, constant conflict. What can keep us from fighting for one another? in our marriage is fighting with each other. Now conflict is inevitable, but we've got to, to resolve that. We've got to find, we'll talk about conflict in another lesson. Uh, another is obsession with occupation. We may be working so hard at working that it impacts the work that we should be doing in our marriage. It's easy to get caught up in, in work. And, and we, we're balancing principles, aren't we? Does anybody know what 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 8 says? I'll start you off and see if you've heard it before. If anyone provides not for his own, especially those of their own household, what does the Bible say they've done? Divorce them and after them. Oh, that's the second part of it. Before he says that, Bible says they've denied the faith and are worse than an infidel. You have a God-given responsibility to take care of the needs of your home. Um, I think we'll have a place somewhere we talk about evaluating and assessing needs, but um, 
this is not a, a, an argument against being hardworking people. God wants us to be. But what's the key? Balance. We can go too far in, in our obsession with that that it, it impacts our marriage negatively. Um, so how do you know when you've crossed that line? How do you know when you're working too hard at work and not hard enough on your marriage? Can you know? When you come home, you're all done. Okay, well, so the trick is to find it out before it's too late. All right, so that's what we're trying to do here. Somebody said something in the back? Say, I thought I was going to get the, the, the answer. Finally. What was that? So, so how do you know? How do you know if you go too far? I said when you come home, the dog don't know you. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good indicator. Um, and that may be when you're in Rick's department, you've gone too far. How about this? Some, some tangible stuff you can sink your teeth into. When work interferes with important family activities on a recurring basis, such as dinner and bedtime rituals, and one spouse has to carry the load of evening responsibilities. Now, you maybe work out a good system. There's some certain impediments to that, but with, within a framework of how you can work on that, that's a way to know. Number two, when you can't count on being home at predictable times, that's, a, that's just a question to, to ask. When your work interferes with big marital events, such as anniversaries or birthdays. When you are physically home, and psychologically absent. When you're there, but you're not there because you're back there at work. Um, and we'll have more to say about these as we go. Time travel. I, I don't know how much uh, uh, that is a problem, but when we act like we're not uh, married, we act like we're, we're single and, and we are so devoted to things we want to do in our interest and so forth that we prioritize that uh, over our spouse. Again, that's balance. Somebody mentioned this earlier, self-service. A lot of spouses are kept from working hard in marriage by selfishness. And somebody mentioned that. They're always tuned in to WIIFM. Y'all know that station, right? What's in it for me? Right, their, their favorite song is that old Janet Jackson classic, What Have You Done For Me Lately? I can tell who's... In my general time age, that, that laugh. We wait on our spouse to go first. Take the first step to do for us. There's no way for us to be exhausted and cover everything that keeps us from working hard. But the things that I have mentioned are enough to take, they can take a toll on a marriage. And all of these are basically reinvestments from our marriage into something else. And they rob us of the resources that we need to work hard in building up our marriages. And we may lose sight of what God intended for marriage. Mark chapter 10 and verse 9. What God has joined together, let not man separate. Just like a bank will hire guards to take care of its money, each of us as spouses must guard and protect the core of our marriage. Love. And so, there are hindrances. What we're going to... I like this. I want to get next week... Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with the positive part of this. What's the solution? Um, because we're all always going to be wrestling. You know, you didn't give me uh, everything that could make this list, but there's always going to be those things that are pulling at us and are trying to, to work against the closeness that we want in our marriage. And, and I, I, something that happened when, I don't know how long Kathy and I have been married, but we were sitting with a couple who would have had to have been close to our age at the time, thought they had a wonderful marriage, and they did have a wonderful marriage. He was one of our deacons. I guess they've been married about 28, 29, 30 years. It was a long time. And uh, they were sitting with us at a potluck and they said, you know, it's still a struggle for us at times. We, we still haven't got it. We're, we're still working on it. We, we still haven't got it figured out. And I know that there are folks who've been married here 30, 40, 50 years. Um, Kathy and I, the Lord blesses us to be married 29 years in May. We're still working on it. We're still trying to iron out these things because the thing about all the, the matters on this list is, is you can you can get these things a, a system worked out on, on all of them, but that doesn't mean they go away. You think about the things you worry about. Do you still worry about the same things you worried about when you were 21? Y'all are still 21. But, I mean, you know. <laughs> but do you think? They ever come? So let's say when you're 21 and you're just starting out 23, 25, and you're newlyweds, and you look at your income and your outgo, and you think, oh man, how are we gonna, how is this gonna work? Have you ever had a time like that in your married life? And it was a real spiritual struggle, the worry. 
you learn how to, to, to handle that, a lot of different solutions to that. But do money worries ever come up again at different points in your life? And you think about those other problem areas, you see, the beautiful thing is God gives us the resources that we need to handle all these things. There is no problem that you have in your marriage that's bigger than his ability to help you with it. So don't ever miss that fact. But you're going to continue to have to work at it. It's not going to just happen. Cutting lawns, cooking, um, whatever, the, the sport, the sewing, whatever it is that you do, you've got to, you've got to stay at it and continue to invest in it. And as you do, you'll, you'll continue to see the reward. Yes, sir. Well, I think we forget there's four working on the marriage. That's good. I never, I, I've heard three, but I never heard four. I know. There, there, there's four working on the marriage. And one wants you to succeed. One wants you to fail. And you just have to decide which team you're going to be on. That's right. You cast the tie breaker as, as a couple. That's good. Right. Let's talk about next week um, what it takes and what it does. We can, we can work on it. All right. Thank you. Oh, actually, actually, I need to tell you this. We're going to take a one-week pause. Uh, I'm going to be in Florida uh, next week preaching. So um, we'll, we'll be back here on the, what was, what's the night? 13. We'll be back here on the, thank you. 